Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I will teach you gene control, which is the last section of chapter 16 of the A Level Biology syllabus. If you have just found the channel, again I will say that I am posting the content in chronological order so that students can easily follow either for pre-exposure to content or for you to prepare for your exams, whichever phase you are at, this is a good resource for you. After this chapter, I am going to do a paper five, um, which is very unfamiliar. It's the paper five my students did in their mock exams. And I'm going to walk through it here on YouTube just so that other students can benefit from how to answer such questions. Of course, my students would walk through it with me in classroom, but I just wanted to post it up here so that other students can see how these questions can look really complicated, but have really, really easy answers. For gene control, we are going to discuss how prokaryotes, so things like bacteria, and eukaryotes, things like us or plants, um, control genes. And the biggest thing to know is that genes are not turned on all the time. So there are some genes that are expressed based on whether or not they are needed. And that is what we're going to speak about in essence in this chapter, or in this section rather. So gene control in prokaryotes is the first thing, and we first need to learn what transcription factors are. Transcription factors, and sort of, I've sort of put everything in blocks here so that it's easy for you to just follow um, and maybe write them down if you feel the need to, if that would help you remember. But transcription factors are factors that bind to a DNA sequence and control the flow of information from DNA to RNA. In other words, transcription factors are responsible for sort of controlling what genes are transcribed. If you remember in chapter six, we spoke about DNA replication and we also spoke about um, protein synthesis. And what transcription factors simply do are they are the factors that control the conversion of DNA to RNA, not the conversion, the copying of DNA to RNA so that we can make proteins. We also have what we call the structural genes. And structural genes are the genes that code for proteins that are needed by the cell. So they form part of the cellular structure and sometimes they act as enzymes. We have regulatory genes and those are genes that code for proteins that regulate the expression of other genes, just like the name suggests. So basically these genes ensure that certain genes are expressed or they ensure that they are not expressed depending on what the need is. If this sounds confusing at the beginning, please don't be confused because there are, there are good examples that you will see as we go along. Repressible enzymes, from the name repressible, from the word rather repressible, simply means that you can prevent these enzymes from being synthesized, okay, by putting a repressor, so by binding a repressor to the specific part of the gene called an operator, you can stop that gene from being expressed. You also have inducible enzymes, and inducible enzymes are enzymes that are produced whenever their substrates um, are present. You also have what is called an operon, and operon is a length of DNA, making up a unit of gene expression. Now, typically, these are just um, definitions that you should have at the back of your mind. I think something you would have noticed if you have been practicing CIE questions is that they hardly ask you for definitions except for when they're giving about two marks or four marks here and there. Um, and obviously it's good for you to remember them, but just don't depend on them as what you need to really know in order to succeed in the paper. Um, so you should know what they are. You should know what an operon is, what an inducible enzyme is. And I often tell students that if you find it difficult to remember what the full definition is, always draw some inference from the word itself, from the fact that it says inducible enzymes. It means that it can be induced and that the, what would induce it is the presence of its substrate. Repressible enzymes, on the other hand, are enzymes that can be prevented from being synthesized by binding a repressor. So the repressor would repress them um, to a part of the, of the protein called an operator. And all of these are found in prokaryotes. Now, as an example, or as the focus for your syllabus, we usually look at the LAC operon. The LAC operon is an operon that basically is a unit of genes, just like we said, um, has different genes on it, and it's a unit of DNA, and it typically looks something like this. I got this image from the textbook that I am using, the one that I spoke about in the first video, the very first video um, on this channel which is the chapter 1.1 video. And so over here, you can see that um, we have what is called the operator. Um, and the operator is basically like a very important region of the gene where if you have a repressor bound to the operator, 
then you would not be able to have the synthesis of certain genes. And by this, you can call the LAC operon or the LAC genes, you can call them, um, the, you can call the LAC operon a repressible operon or you can call it an inducible operon, depending on how you choose to see it. But let's look at it in a bit more detail. The LAC operon codes for an enzyme called beta-galactosidase, um, which is this over here. And what that enzyme does is that it breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. If you remember from chapter two, when we were discussing biological molecules, we said that lactose was a disaccharide and it is made up of glucose and galactose. So what the LAC operon does is it synthesizes genes that enable the breakdown of lactose. Now, you've probably heard of people being lactose intolerant, and that's usually because they don't have enzymes to break down lactose. In this case, the LAC operon is situated in bacteria. So we are speaking about prokaryotes. Please don't make this mistake because students tend to do so. They tend to confuse the LAC operon because it talks about lactose and lactose intolerance um, or because, well, teachers might think of teaching it that way. They tend to confuse it as something that happens in the eukaryotes cell, but this happens only in prokaryotes. So the LAC operon is controlled. It's not switched on all the time in uh, bacteria. There are three genes on the LAC operon. It has LAC Z, which is this over here just drawing lines um, to show where it is. Um, we also have LAC Y over here, and we have LAC A over here. LAC Z codes for beta-galactosidase, which is the key um, gene. Uh, LAC Y codes for permease, and LAC A codes for transacetylase. And all of these three genes are very important in the LAC operon and in the breakdown of lactose. So what happens? Now, like I said earlier, in this case, we're referring to gene control, and we're basically talking about the fact that genes are not always expressed, or certain genes are not always expressed, and they're expressed only when they are needed. In this case, the LAC operon is an example of such, and it is found in prokaryotes. So now, because the LAC operon is responsible for the hydrolysis of lactose, it means that it would only be expressed if lactose is present. If lactose is not present, then the LAC operon would not be expressed. So what happens when lactose is absent, not present, that is? What will happen in this case is that the regulatory gene, so remember the definition slide, we spoke about a regulatory gene that regulates the expression of certain genes, um, of other genes rather. The regulatory gene will code for what we call a repressor. The repressor would come and it would bind to the operator. So you can see it over here. I'm just going to circle it. The repressor comes and it binds to the operator. And when it binds to the operator, what it does is that it prevents RNA polymerase. So you can see this is RNA polymerase trying to come into this operator region so that it can move across and transcribe the three LAC genes. So that's LAC Z, LAC Y, and LAC A. But because a repressor is bound there, RNA polymerase is unable to bind. And as a result of that, there is no transcription of these genes. And as a result, there is no synthesis of beta-galactosidase or beta-galactosidase uh, permease and transacetylase. And so that means that the LAC operon is not expressed because a repressor binds to the operator. It is also important to note that the repressor has two binding sites. So we call that allosteric if you remember from our enzymes chapter. If you don't remember these things, please do yourself a favor and just go back and have a look at them because they would be really helpful. It has more than one binding site. So it has a binding site where it attaches itself to the operator, but it also has a different binding site for lactose. And I'm going to show you how that plays a role in the expression of the lac operon. Now, when lactose is present, what will happen is the bacteria will take up lactose from solution. So remember, when you're growing bacteria, um, you can grow them in different media. So let's assume that this is a liquid medium. And in this liquid medium, we have put all of the things that the bacteria needs. We've put glucose, we've put our nutrients, and then we've decided to put lactose in as well. If this is a bacteria that's able to utilize lactose, it will take up lactose. Now, don't forget, the repressor, when lactose is not present, sits here by the operator. When lactose is present, lactose molecules would bind to the repressor at its other site. Can you see that over there? 
when those bind to the repressor, they will cause the repressor to move away from the operator because it's basically like a signal. It's like the body is now saying, or the bacteria is now saying, well, the bacterium rather is now saying, now we have lactose in the solution. So lactose goes and binds as a signal to the repressor to say, I'm here now, you have to let go. The repressor then, then detaches from the operator and that allows RNA polymerase to bind and as you can see here, RNA polymerase is then able to move across and transcribe these three genes. When lactose is absent again, the repressor will be coded for, it will sit there on the promoter, I'm sorry, on the operator and prevent the transcription of the LACZ, LACY and LACA genes. So I hope that was helpful because I know it can be a bit confusing for students, but it is really direct information. If you don't understand it, please post in the comments and I'm sure somebody will respond to you as soon as possible. Now, prokaryotes are not the only ones that use gene control. We also have gene control in eukaryotes. Now, I usually didn't see questions about this um, in the biology papers, but I recently came across a paper that asked this question and so I felt it was important to explain it to students. Now, when we learned about um, coordination in plants, I believe, we spoke about how gibberellins can allow the growth um, of plants and also the germination of seeds. What gibberellin does is that it also controls the transcription of certain genes um, within a plant. And that is what I'm going to explain in this, um, on this slide here. Now, typically in seeds, in seed germination, we have gibberellin secretion. So when you take a seed and you put it in soil where it has access to nutrients and access to some water, the take up of that water will activate the production of gibberellins within the seed. Gibberellins will then code for amylase and will then stimulate the production of amylase rather. And amylase will then allow the seeds to break down the starch molecules that are hidden within it or that are stored within it. And that then leads to germination because breaking down the starch gives it some energy and it's then able to germinate and to grow. Now, whenever you apply gibberellins to seeds, it has been found that there is an increase in the production of amylase. That means that gibberellin is controlling the transcription of the genes that produce amylase. The way it does this is very, very easy. There is a transcription factor called PIF, which is this one over here. When a seed is dormant, PIF typically just stays in the seed because it can't move simply because it has this thing called DELA and DELA is bound to PIF. And what DELA does by binding to PIF is that it prevents it from being able to transcribe the genes that code for amylase. What will then happen is when gibberellin is applied, gibberellin will go and bind to its receptor within. And when it binds to that receptor, it combines with an enzyme that is inside the seed. Those, that two, those two combinations rather, um, the gibberellin with its receptor and the enzyme will then break down DELA. Once DELA is broken down, as you can see here, broken to pieces, PIF is then able to bind to the operon that codes for amylase and it's then able to allow the transcription of amylase. That is how direct the role of gibberellin is in gene control for eukaryotes. Now, again, I saw this question and I think it was for three marks. Um, so please, by all means, if you did not get that, you can rewind it or you can post a question in the comments. That is it from me for chapter 16. I'm going to do a chapter five after this, um, not chapter five, a paper five. Um, and it's the paper five my students wrote in the mock exams this year, 2021. And I'm just going to show you um, how seemingly difficult questions can be really, really easy and how you can get fantastic marks by just doing them correctly. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. And again, until the next video, have a good time. Goodbye.